Let it be. Generation 10, Chapter 1. Courageous Stupidity. I've been told that uh, talking is supposed to help. That I'm supposed to stand here and jabber on while you just sit there and listen to me. They tell me it's supposed to help you. To hear me. (laughs) Maybe it'll make you rethink your situation. Maybe it will change things. (laughs) I think they just tell people like me that. I think it helps me a lot more than it helps you. (sighs) I'm not so good at small talk. I'm sure you remember that much. I'm better at stories. So I'm going to tell you a story. The story is... (laughs) Well, it's very near and dear to me. It's the story of someone I admire. (sighs) Someone I love. Someone who changed my life. This is the story of the life and the murder of Brant Mason. The beginning of this story is not the beginning of Brant Mason's life. His childhood was like any other. He was born, he grew up, he grew older. The story I want to tell you began the day that he turned 16 years old. It was a birthday that had begun typically. He woke up to his mom cooking him breakfast. He went to school where his friends gave him a hard time about turning 16 and being able to drive them places. His day was perfectly normal until the final bell rang, announcing that school was finished for the day. Brent gathered his things and began to walk outside, just like any normal day. Except, on this day, a classmate bumped into Brent and sent his books flying. I'm sorry, Brent, the classmate called. I'd stop, but I gotta catch the bus. See you tomorrow. Brant sighed and shook his head as he bent down to pick up his books. He gathered them into his hand and decided to stuff as many as he could into his backpack to avoid another incident. Even in just a couple minutes since the bell rang, the school had suddenly quieted. It made sense, Brant thought to himself as his ears began to hum white noise. How many times had he run out of the building at full speed to get home just a half second faster. He walked out of the classroom and started down the hall, imagining to himself what sort of birthday treats awaited him at home. It was as he was walking down the hall that he heard an odd sound coming from the boys' bathroom. It sounded like someone crying. Suddenly, the cries grew louder as the sound of muffled shuffling started. Curious, Brant pushed the door open just a crack and saw a group of guys. There were about five of them. Two of them were from Brant's class, though he didn't know their names offhand. The other three he recognized as a grade above his. One of them was an athlete. His letterman's jacket looked perfectly pressed and clean. They were moving strangely, and Brant realized with a start that they were circled around something, and they were hitting it as hard as they could. Suddenly, the biggest one, the athlete, stopped and stepped away. Through the gap of people, Brant could see a broken, bleeding boy. Even through the blood and the swelling, Brant could recognize this boy. It was a classmate of his, someone who he'd been partnered up with in biology a few times. Brant racked his brain for the boy's name, his nerves betraying him. Royce, or Roy, that was the boy's name. Without even hazarding a guess, Brant knew exactly why they were beating this boy up. Fucking queer, the athlete cried as he delivered a kick to Roy's ribs. You think you can look at me? Hit on me? You sick fuck. One of the boys from Brant's grade circled around Roy before leaning down and hitting him repeatedly in the back. Brant could see the attacker snarl, his teeth gritted together and the spit flying from his mouth from the force of each blow. We don't want your kind around here, faggot. Brant felt nauseous. He could feel the bile rising in his throat and he wanted nothing more than to run away. He wanted to flee the scene, forget he'd ever seen it, and pretend that it wasn't real. (laughs) This sort of thing only happened in movies. Brent knew there was bullying in schools and that kids who were different were picked on, but they weren't beaten savagely. They weren't targeted for violence on this scale. If he ran now, he could make it home in time without his mom knowing that he had seen anything. Yet, something kept Brent from moving. 
In his mind's eye, Brent suddenly saw the thing he had feared the most, but had never let himself truly think about. His brother's face, broken and bleeding on the bathroom floor while boys just like the ones in front of him savagely beat him. His brother Kenneth had come out to him and his family two years ago. Bran had been worried about his fate in high school, but he never let himself truly think about the dangers his younger brother faced. He tried to shut his eyes, but the images only continued to flash, and suddenly he saw the sad, disappointed face of his parents. His mother's. You see, Brant Mason was the child of a homosexual couple. The beatings and the bashings rang especially true with him. He wondered how he had escaped the ridicule at school, and he imagined his Momo's face when she heard that he had stood by while another kid was beaten up for being gay. She would be disappointed, sad, and most importantly, angry. And Madison Mason was not the sort of woman you wanted to be angry. <sighs> Brant also knew, deep in his heart, that it was the right thing to do. And that was why he couldn't step away. Brent dropped his books and slammed the door open. The boys whirled around and glared at him menacingly. This doesn't concern you, Mason, the athlete snarled. Get away from him, Brent replied, surprised that the older boy knew his name. Or what? We're just exercising our right to freedom of expression. Free speech means we can hate whoever we want to hate. And we hate fags. Wait, 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 Danny. Mason here has two mommies, one of the boys from Brant's grade exclaimed. Brant shot his classmate a hateful look. The older boy's eyebrows lifted slightly. Brant had thought the fact that his mothers were lesbians was well known throughout the school. Apparently he was wrong, but now that he had come to the defense of this boy, he would be targeted. Oh, really? The ringleader, Danny, said with a growing smirk. Maybe we should pay them a visit. You know, a lesbian's just a woman who hasn't had a good dick. Fury ripped through Brant's heart. He launched himself at the ringleader and tackled him into a locker. He sat back and got two punches into the bully's face before his friends lifted him off. Brant was pushed down to the floor and the other boys began to kick him. His ribs, face, back, and even his testicles burned with pain. He had no breath, no feeling. And he truly believed in that moment. He was going to die. Suddenly, as the white numbness of overwhelming pain surrounded him, Brant heard a voice. Get up, was all the voice said. Brant felt his sense return to him, and he reached up and grabbed one of the boy's feet. He had been throwing so much of his weight into his kicks that the bully immediately fell off balance and hit the floor. The other boys, shocked into stillness, had stopped kicking. Brant forced his body to roll. He rolled into the feet of two of his attackers, causing them to lose their balance and fall as well. Brant scrambled to his feet while the other boys tried to help each other. Brant couldn't make it to his feet, but opted to crawl towards Roy. He was determined to help the boy out of the bathroom. Suddenly, just as Brant had reached Roy, the door opened. What the hell? Everyone in the bathroom looked up to see the astonished face of one of the vice principals looking at them. The adult pulled his cell phone out of his tweed pocket, dialed 911, and shouted for the school nurse. So, the other boy here tells me that you came into the bathroom to his defense. You attacked the boys who were attacking him, five against one. I gotta tell you, kid, that was both really brave and really stupid. Anyone else would have done it, Brent replied. He looked up into the aged face of the police officer, one of the first responders on the scene. They had arrested the attackers, and an ambulance had come for Roy. The paramedics had rushed for Brent, but he waved them off and told them to help Roy first. While he waited for his turn, the officer came over to talk with him. <laughs> no, kid, they wouldn't have. Your father'd be real proud of you. Brant chuckled. <laughs> Madison Mason is my mother. The officer guffawed and gave him a light punch on the arm before shaking his head. Well, I see where you get your courageous stupidity from. So, planning on following in her footsteps, become a hero firefighter, and run into burning buildings? That's like running into a fight outnumbered. 
<laughs> I think you're just as likely to get killed. Brent wrapped his arms around himself as best he could. His body was aching and he felt so exhausted. He just wanted to sleep. The aching pain in his head worried him. He didn't want a concussion. Fires aren't for me. I've seen her come home with too many burns, too many times. Well, we could always use someone brave like you for Riverview PD. Think about it. When you're old enough, come down to the station if you're interested. I think the paramedics are ready for you. Your mother and your grandfather would be real proud of you, kid. You did good today. Brent stood and turned towards the ambulance and saw Roy being wheeled into the back. Roy lifted his hand towards Brent. He knew it was more movement than the boy could really manage. Even, th even though he had a tube in his nose and his face was bloody and swollen, Brent could see gratitude in the boy's face. It filled Brant's heart with more emotion than he had felt in a long time. He turned towards the cop who had been talking to him and looked him over. Courageous stupidity aside, Brant knew then what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to join the Boys in Blue at the Riverview Police Department. He wanted to help people like Roy and protect them from harm. His eyes drifted over to the police car. To protect and serve. Brant took the message to heart. Two years later, when Brant turned 18 and graduated, he enrolled in the police academy. He graduated, but he didn't get a job at the Riverview Police Department. Instead, he got a very promising offer from the Elmira City Police Force. So the rookie cop packed up his things and moved to the big city.